The theme of today or in this episode is chrome spheres or gaze balls or clays and um, metal, chrome, <laughs> whatever, steel balls. And this is the fastest method to capture the light situation from a set or from a location. And it's maybe not the best quality and the resolution that you get out of it is maybe the smallest possible <laughs> from all these methods. And even with a fisheye, I get way more resolution out of, out of that. This is more for the light intensity and maybe for areas and colors. It's not so much for the reflection or for color information by itself, detail information, so to say. And always when you have a reflection on a CG object, if that object is concave or convex or just flat, makes a big difference how much resolution you finally need. But that's a theme on its own. However, I had here a lens on my camera, 400 mm, and this gave me not the largest distance to the chrome sphere, so I can see the camera inside, and you will see this, of course. And the longer the lens, the better, but as well, the bigger the sphere is, the better, because then each scratch is smaller. And I haven't gotten so far a 100% perfect chrome sphere, and I collect them <laughs> nearly. <laughs> I have all sizes for a pocket, for... Anyway, you will see how big it goes, finally. And chrome is normally the nicest. Steel is not so reflective. I have a very expensive steel and it was really a disappointment. Glass by itself is not perfect and you guess it breaks. <laughs> so it's expensive on the end when you have to replace it again and again. But anyway, one inch or two inch Chrome spheres are most of the time sufficient when you have a long lens. So, from the perspective of the chrome sphere here, you can see I have here an holder because this was supposedly uh, this was normally supposed to be an end cap from something that you can screw together. And you see those things maybe in hotels where they carry luggage around or a rail on a staircase, something like that. I paid, I think, 20 bucks for this. The steel was 100 and the gaze ball in class, which i show you later, was $10 in an... I don't know what shop. <laughs> anyway, long lens and, of course, again, I used my promote to get lots of shots. And let's have a look how much finally you get out of this sphere here, because that's pretty amazing. Just a little sketch to make it really clear what we have. When we have here our camera, and then we have a very long lens, so we have that as field of view, maybe 5 degrees from the 400, and then we place here our sphere inside. And I notice that there's sometimes the opinion it can capture 180 degrees, so that would be maybe exactly this. Comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out. But it's way more. And the truth is that this few ray here touches nearly and then it goes a little bit outside and a little bit outside. So the more the camera is away from this sphere, the more it touches here nearly parallel and reflects. So the space that I can't see from the background here is maybe a little bit bigger than just the sphere by itself. But also, this area here that is perpendicular to the camera and tangential to the few ray or ray views, <laughs> that has, of course, then the least amount of resolution in the final picture. So that's a critical spot here. I have prepared in Cinema 4D a scene where you can see how far it finally goes, and you can test this on your own because it's the law of physics and so it works nicely. So what I have done here in Cinema 4D, I have a camera here, that's the first point we certainly want to know. And this is also here 400 mm, so I have recreated exactly what I had on set. And the sphere itself is here, a radius of 105 mm, so to say, <laughs> when I take here that scale. And that was pretty much the same, so distance field of view fits all together and I have this view here now from that camera. 
when I switch this off for a moment, I can see here the setup of the whole camera. I have my chrome sphere here, whoops, and I have two pale blue balls here or spheres. And this is when I go here from the camera and have these tangential view. I wanted to see how much I can see and what I miss out in the background. And of course, keep in mind that when we have the camera here and the scene camera would come from the same position, then we would have no need for this. Having said that, <laughs> when we normally want to have a full panorama from that, normally the idea is to move the camera 90 degrees around and shoot from here and then overlap the resulting panorama, of course. I don't want to do this here because it's just an introduction to that, but two of these would be nice and 90 degrees is normally the rule if you can measure that precisely. Okay, so and then I have your numbers and you see here already it's one time around 0, 2, 330 and 360 would be then of course 0, 0, 0. And when I switch my camera here on, I can see my chrome sphere and I can't see really the blue ones. They are out of this view here. I go to the full frame view and I render this. And now I can read exactly how much degree I can see from this position. Of course, the further the camera goes away, the more I might see here. So 30 degrees, 60, 90, and that is only half. So this would be here already in 180 degree view, like a fisheye. Then 120, 150 here, already fairly distorted. And here I can see the blue reflection from the sphere. I switch both off for a sec and you can see it's gone. <laughs> and I can see even here a little bit from the 8 here, which is not really high. So the space behind the sphere is not really big. I could take the sphere away, shoot it and patch it on the back as well, if I'm fine with all the distortion that it has anyway. So we have here roughly set a 300 degree view, maybe 240 when you want to have less distortion, but 240 degree is a lot of stuff from my point of view, 120 plus 120. Okay, so let's have a look to the results here. And here we have already our exposure series and I go each time two stops up and as you can see it goes more and more to the right side in terms of histogram and that is exactly where we are after. So we have nearly nothing left on the right side and everything is empty on the left side with the brightest exposure and with the darkest we have nearly nothing on the right and only a tiny little bit here on the left side. So we have here nine images, each two exposures apart, which means from my point of view 16 stops because from one to the next to the next is eight spaces between the nine at all. Okay, this is completely black, but we have the sun here inside and this is completely white. So it might be a little bit less in terms of dynamic range. But we can see here, except for the sun, where we could go higher and higher in the shorter time <laughs> or just stop it down more and more, this point would go away maybe after a long time and this is the sun and you can see here these little sprinkles <laughs> freckles these are imperfections of the sphere that's something that is maybe not really nice when you want to work with it and i didn't scratch this whole thing here a lot but when you take a look here there's all over the place something and when you take a look here, this is roughly five and a half thousand pixels wide. So we can use here maybe three thousand roughly over a thumb. And the area here where we saw the blue spheres in our picture, that is not really usable, but it gives light information. So another big mistake on set, if you are in a picture, <laughs> don't have white clothes on. That's not what a photographer should wear. But to make the point, I did this of course. And you could have a dark green blanket for this one here on, or maybe just a gray one. 
and gray clothes is for jobs like this maybe the best idea to not suck in all the light with a black blanket over the shoulder or just a white blanket middle gray gives a roughly the same idea of the set hopefully it's dependent on the set of course okay and then we have something completely different here and i have to move here a little bit up and i want to show you of course the big sphere the gaze ball and i have placed it here just on the floor and you see here the gray card that i had on my little holder here on my c-stand and this gray card gives me here of course information enough it's from my point of view too close to the grass wanted to show you that which mistake can happen when you go here just with the gray card that should measure the light from the overall scene too close to an area it looks greenish and the whole scene is of course based on the closeness to the floor relatively green the quality by itself is much better from my point of view it's big but i have here also micro scratches in it and of course, these glass balls or gaze balls are never really perfect. You have some areas where you think, hmm, is that not possible to make it more precise? But the overall impression is better. And we are after the light here, not so much the quality in terms of optical precision. Of course, if you could have that, I wouldn't say anything. I would say yes, of course, to it, but it's a money question always. So this is pretty much all. And just a little overview of how it works. We put these pictures into the merge to HDR in, get all these exposure values, and then we get an histogram where we can take a first look. And this histogram has mostly an idea where we should set our white point. That's only a visual. It's nothing that changed anything. And here, this area is, of course, the sun. And again, this slider here gives you only the option to adjust this for the viewing experience. In Photoshop, it changed nothing. The values stay as they are. So this sums it up. We go into that in detail in a later episode. Thanks for listening. Have fun with it. Bye-bye.